where one day per year in 63 different countries, the leader of the least get out of the community to try to create a positive impact. Russian Justice Commitment is a program that was launched in 2020 by which Lili committed to, to provide uh, 25 million over five years to support this cause. We have been able to make significant progress in terms of uh, working with the black vendors and suppliers and also we have had a significant progress in uh, hiring people from minorities that will be unrepresented. We are defining our operations in a way affecting business like economic mobility, racial equity, market sustainability. I'm so proud to start with the fact that we're all in. We come together because we inherently value working alongside one another. And more importantly, we believe that the outcomes will be better because we're all in. This behavior... For anybody that's lived in Charlotte, people have got the spirit of we can't do this and we will do this working together. There is a true spirit of a partnership between businesses, health systems, and also the government. And I think that's really going to propel us going forward in this new world. The innovation district here in Charlotte will really define this region in a new way. We came together with Wake Forest University and Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center. It'll have a medical school on the campus surrounded by essentially these businesses and these laboratories that are discovering new cures. We have scientists, we'll have clinicians, we'll have other health uh, professions on that campus, and we'll have other uh, professional studies. One thing I will say about the business leaders in Charlotte, they have tremendous civic commitment on your knowledge and our law, London, and Paris. You need it to be an interesting city. So business should be involved in making it a city that's fun to live in, right to raise a family in, and great to work in. But what I hope for Charlotte is that we continue to grow, but that we grow in a way that we can manage. That is, we continue to build parks, and we need to support our school system. We need to make it a place that's good for everybody that lives. So we really need to work on affordable housing, I think if you look back, the state of Bank of America has participated financially as well as with its people in almost every good thing that's happened in the South City. It's sort of what you do in Charlotte if you run a business. You look after your city and you look after the people that work for you and with you and your customers and all the people who wish for our customers. So it's just the right thing to do. And you continue to demonstrate your commitment to this region. And for all of that, we're grateful for you. I can stand here today and say with a high degree of confidence that I am proud to be a part of this organization. And I am proud of the work that we have accomplished together this year. As the force of businesses, the Charlotte Regional Business Alliance is at the intersection of many of the important and impactful things that are happening in our community. In the last two years, we've remained focused, and you continue to demonstrate your commitment to this region. And for all of that, we're grateful for you. I can stand here today and say with a high degree of confidence that I am proud to be a part of this organization. And I'm proud of the work that we have accomplished together this year. As the force of businesses, the Charlotte Regional Business Alliance is at the intersection of many of the important and impactful things that are happening in our community. In the last two years, we've remained focused on Honeywell, Darius Adamchak, Chairman and CEO of Lowe's Company, and Chief Chair of the Board and CEO of Bank of America, Brian Moynihan, and joining to moderate our executive conversation, Chancellor of UNC Charlotte, Dr. Sharon L. Gaber. Let's give it up.
are CEOs from three Charlotte-based Fortune 100 companies, and I know that each of them will offer us a strong, unique perspective as we take a look at some of the trends that occurred in 2022, and we look ahead with a few predictions on what to expect here in Charlotte and across the country for 2023. So we'll start, Darius, with you. Uh, let's look back over the past year. What would you say has been the biggest lesson for the economy that we've learned? Well, first of all, great to be here again and be part of the group, and great to see everybody in three dimensions, rather, too. That's always a lot of there. But, uh, but I think, you know, kind of a tough, good time to keep, but I'm just kind of looking for a normal year. I really am. You know, we haven't had tattoos since 2015. Uh, we were sitting here last year. Here. First, it's great to be here again and uh, share the stage with my colleagues. But uh, and, and it's just it's, it's fun. Look forward to this every year. And if you were sitting here last year, I think we're, the idea that we're sort of still engaged in debate about transitory inflation and many of us sitting you know, this kind of weight. So, what does it tell you about the current state of the economy? Well, thank you. Uh, I think what's interesting, we have stores in, in all 50 states, so we have a pretty good, you know, View of the U.S. business, and we're fortunate, and I say fortunate in this kind of environment to be a U.S.-based business. I know there is your global business, and you're dealing with factors in Europe and in Asia. We sourced out of them. All right, prediction. So, look, I'm an eternal optimist with the glass always being half full. So, because, you know, and I can speak specifically for my industry because I wouldn't dare try to provide a broader view or try to project. What is bouncing around in Chairman's pile or anyone in the administration's head right now about economic policy? But what I would tell you is because there are a couple of factors that support housing relative to housing appreciation, as I discussed earlier, we feel very confident that although there will be some form of economic slowdown, we don't see anything that leads us to believe we're going to have a massive economic shock that will create a massive recession, both locally or anywhere in the U.S. And therefore, we believe that our business trend will remain strong for, for all the factors. And I'll just leave one additional data point relative to, to my business. One of the key correlating factors to demand is the age of housing stock. In other words, how old are the existing homes in the U.S.? And today, the average age of housing in the U.S. is 41 years old oldest since World War II, and that is driven primarily because we never recovered from the financial crisis to get home building back up to the levels it was pre-financial crisis. And so now we have high demand, we have lower supply, and you have higher interest rates, and it all points to the fact that you have less home building and more of us staying in our existing homes and making those homes better, and I think that will go well for Charlotte from a, the housing appreciation for our business, and so that's that's my view of the economy going into next year. Thank you, Darius. Yeah, so overall, on a global level, I think it's going to be a tougher economy in 23 versus 22. And I think in some of the regions like Europe, I think are just going to be facing tougher times. Um, when, when I think about the U.S., um, I still think it's going to be okay. I don't think it's going to be as, as good as it was in 22. And I have a couple of the things I look at, which is if you think about Roughly two thirds of our economy is driven by the consumer. And if you look at the saving rates, oh, they're coming down. They have been coming down since 2020. And if you look at sort of the savings, and hopefully I get this right, but right, and correct, that the saving rates, the actual saving examples, are still better off for the average saver now than they were prior to 2019, which tells you that the consumer is still relatively healthy now. The fact is, Inflation is by its outpacing wage increase. Brian talked about this, which is we have to contain inflation. That's a must do by it. And although it's going to be a little painful for Honeywell, maybe all the businesses here, we have to contain it. And I'm going to be very supportive of the interest rate on that because that's absolutely a problem. So, so, in summary, from the US, they see a tougher economy, but similar to Marvin, I don't see a meltdown far from. So I said earlier, we see a mild recession and a recovery during the year. I think 
inflation will be a discussion point for all next year's prediction. I think at the end of the day, uh, if the Fed can engineer what they want, we should feel it's a soft landing and get through. The risks, you know, we'll still be talking about inflation this time next year, we'll still be talking about potentially a ground war in Europe, we'll still be talking about China and US trade tensions, but what we'll also still be talking about is how America is a better place to be than anywhere else in these times because of the innovation and capability. And we'll also be talking about how this community will fare better in And it's because of all the things that Margaret and Derek is talking about, the cooperation between the government and the business community and the society here is top shelf. And so we're gonna have better unemployment, better GDP outcomes. We need to get some housing built, we need to get this keep working on those schools, all those struggles, but in some ways, you know, there are higher quality problems than anybody else in the world will have, so let's get to work on them. Excellent. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you for joining us. Keep energy, Brian Zavora. They must consistently perform extraordinary acts on behalf of others. That truly enhances the quality of life for the members of the And they must be committed to racial equity, advocacy efforts, economic growth, and community leadership by contributing time, expertise, and resources to the better of the Charlotte region. There aren't many who fit this description, but when you witness these people in action, you know you see something extraordinary. And I think you'll all agree. There's no more deserving recipient of the 2022 Citizen of the Carolinas Award than our own Michael Moscato. Michael is going to really needs an introduction. You know him as a visionary, but the future he envisions is not his own. It's a community vision. But few civic leaders are as skilled as he in doing the work that it takes to make that vision a reality. He and his team at the Foundation for the Carolinas are the hub for community affairs. Affordable housing, health care, COVID response, arts, recreation, the list goes on. I recently heard Michael say, I'm honored to share the stage with such esteemed business leaders to recognize this incredible region that we all call home and to celebrate someone who has truly been a catalyst for positive change in our community. The Citizen of the Carolinas Award acknowledges an individual who has made significant impact in our region. The honoree, through years of accomplishments, has moved the needle to support all who do business here in Charlotte in areas such as civic leadership, public policy, and economic growth. It is the Alliance's most prestigious award. The recipient of this award, Karen Adams. The Charlotte community is awfully lucky to have uh, recruited to Charlotte a long time ago an up and coming dynamic nonprofit executive from Maduro. And we brought him here to be the leader of the Arts and Science Council. And we didn't know that he was going to become an iconic figure. Michael's presence has been so very important since our city has grown so much over the time that he has been active in how we deal with arts and culture and philanthropy. Michael's work has benefited the greater Charlotte region in more ways than we really can count, and I think probably in greater ways than we even recognize today. He has been able to see a vision for this region that few people have been able to, and then he's gone after each piece of that vision to put all of the puzzle pieces in place to make this city what it is today. And he has this unique thing to convene the NGO community, the business community, the government community, the educational community, and say, we got to work on this together. 
we're going to miss Michael because he's so good at that, and he'll leave a heck of a legacy behind because he was so good. As mayor of this great city, one of the lessons that I've learned is that nothing is done without a collaborative effort. And to be able to acknowledge that partnerships are important, collaboration builds a better outcome, as well as to actually act on those things, you can see that in Michael's participation. It's important to have that partnership to move any big initiative. And Michael's depth of experience, his relationships in the public sector, in the private sector, in order to bring all of this together and make a real difference. And Charlotte today is known as a place that can get things done. And I think that's a result of the leadership that Michael and so many have demonstrated, putting public and private partnerships together to move the city forward on big initiatives that make a difference for a long time. The public-private partnerships he's brought together have been tremendous for our community. And I know when I travel to other places, they ask me, how does your community do this? How do you get these people to the table? And while there are lots of people and institutions responsible for that, I don't think we can overlook the role that the foundation under Michael's leadership has played. I have not yet met a person in Charlotte, whether they were from either rung of the economic ladder, bottom or top, that did not have a great deal of respect for him. And that's saying something, because I've never thought of him as a politician, but he probably was, but you didn't think of him I never thought of him as a person who would twist your elbow to get something done, but he probably twisted my elbow many times, and I didn't realize it until afterwards. This guy knew how to relate. He is someone that cares deeply, that people understand that to participate in a democracy, to participate in community, it doesn't always require that you have a PhD, but it is helpful for a community to have a sound foundational educational system. And Michael has worked on that through um, with. He's worked on it through the upper mobility study. He's actually worked on it as a parent and a supporter of our children. And that makes a lot of difference. We have a lot to do, but Michael's been a contributor for a very long time to that. Michael is one of the people that when I need to wrestle with an issue in the community, I call Michael. Because Michael not only has great subject matter expertise, he has great history, and he has this can-do attitude on uh, helping you think through what will be necessary to bring people, resources, stakeholders, funding together to make something happen. He's also not afraid to say this isn't the right time, um, but he's also anxious to say what it is. And I think that can-do spirit and that experience that he brings, the breadth of his relationships, uh, make him such a valuable member of the community and make it possible for Charlotte to do so many things. When you ask me if there's anything else to know about Michael, I think it's going to be very challenging for Michael to stop being Michael. So let's see how that goes. Please join me in welcoming back Malcolm Green. So Michael, I, I thank you. I think I'm a more deserving person than you. A transformative leader and an influential voice in philanthropic whose heart, passion, and commitment are like, unlike no other person in this region. With plans to retire, I know everyone will miss your larger than life presence on a day to day basis, but your impact will leave a legacy for generations to come. Just listen to some of the accomplishments since he took over as president and CEO of the foundation in 1999. Philanthropic gifts to the foundation since Michael's arrival have been more than $6.5 billion. $4.6 billion in grants have been issued. And just this year,
Thank you, Malcolm, for your kind remarks, your exemplary leadership, and most of all, your friendship. Brian, to you and your associates at Duke Energy, I am most grateful for years of robust corporate philanthropy and support of our work. It's really a special honor to be recognized by the generous voices gracing that screen. 